Time to start. During the meeting, he said, I want you to know this was a, a senior citizen. We, gotta go. oh. we, gotta. we welcome you to this forum featuring the candidates who are running for State House 40, District 45A and Districts 45B. The election will be held on Tuesday, November 4th from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. My name is Lois Wendt, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Crystal, New Hope, and East Plymouth. The League of Women Voters is proud of its history of citizen education in our communities and provides these forums to help you to make the most informed decisions in local elections. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization and the views of the candidates are their own. We do not assume responsibility for the contents of the candidates' statements. I'd like to ask you at this time to please turn off your cell phones or any recording devices you may have. Only credentialed media may record this event for purpose of news coverage. It is being cablecast on New, the New Hope City Channel and will be replayed on Channel 12. Candidates may not use debate clips in their campaign ads. Our, mater, our moderator this evening is Kirsten Chomey, a member of the Brooklyn Park Osseo Maple Grove League of Women Voters. Thank you. Good evening. It is my pleasure to be here. Uh, please join me in welcoming the candidates in District 45A and B who wish to become your Minnesota State Representatives. For tonight, our forum is that the both candidates will have up to three minutes to give their opening statements. And it's an opportunity for them to tell us about themselves and their involvement in the community and why they want to represent you in our state government. Following that, the members of the audience may ask questions of the individuals or all candidates. Please write your questions legibly on one of the cards provided and hand it to a league member. I can't ask it if I can't read it. It happens frequently. Questions submitted online will also be given today. All candidates may, ask, may answer any question whether or not it was directed to them. Candidates may take up to one minute to answer these questions from the audience. At the end of the question period, you, the candidates will have up to one minute for your concluding statement. The candidates for District 45A are Mr. Lyndon Carlson, a member of the DFL party, and Mr. Richard Lieberman, a member of the Independent Republican Party. District 45A encompasses most of New Hope, except for Precinct 1 and a northeastern section of Plymouth and Northern Crystal. Our timekeeper is up in the front row there for you. He will indicate to you how much time you have left by showing the yellow sign. You have one minute there in your 30 seconds, and then he will show you when your time has expired. Please finish your statement at that time as I'll be directing the other speaker's turn. Our first candidate to speak by the flip of the coin will be Mr. Richard Lieberman and then Mr. Lyndon Johnson. So we're going to start with your opening sure. statement. The, the president isn't here this evening. Lyndon Johnson, sorry. Carlson. 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 <laughs> I used to be a Johnson, so I think everybody's Johnson, so sorry about that. Okay, the, Mr. Uh, Carlson. Uh, if it's all right, uh, Mr. Lieberman and I, after the flip of the coin on which I won, uh -huh. um, he asked if I would uh, go first, and so You're we've done a change again. there. So You're if that's all right with the moderator, I'll all be right. happy to do that. Thank you. Our first speaker will be Mr. Lyndon Carlson. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, State Representative Lyndon Carlson, the DFL endorsed candidate for re-election in District 45A, which is parts of Crystal, New Hope, and Plymouth. My wife, Carol, and I have lived in the district for 44 years. Uh, by way of uh, background, I'm a uh, retired teacher, having uh, taught uh, for 34 years. Uh, my legislative uh, experience, uh, I'll share with you, uh, is the committee assignments that I have. I'm the uh, chair of the Ways and Means Committee. I serve in the Capital Investment Committee. I serve in the Tax Committee, Property and Local Tax Division, Rules and Legislative Administration. And then by virtue of being chair of the, Capital, or of, chair of the Ways and Means Committee, I serve uh, ex official on all other uh, finance committees. So as you can see by that, I've, I'm intimately involved with uh, the state budget. Uh, as chair of the Wades and Means Committee, I'm proud of the accomplishments of the last legislative session. We passed a balanced budget that paid back our schools and set aside money for a rainy day fund. My legislative priorities are jobs and economic development, great schools, a balanced budget, improved infrastructure, affordable health care, and environmental protection. And that list of issues, by the way, I would point out um, as the uh, chief author of the supplemental budget bill this last session, we virtually touched on every one of those uh, issues in that um, 
very uh, comprehensive uh, piece of legislation. Uh, some of the accomplishments that uh, we had for the last legislative session, uh, we balanced the budget uh, into the future and provided for a rainy day fund. So for the first time in about 10 years, we have a balanced budget. Uh, we made historic investments in education. We increased the um, funding formula and many of the other uh, components within the uh, K-12 finance bill. We, uh, for the first time, provided for all day, every day kindergarten. Uh, early childhood education was another major uh, accomplishment in the area of education. We passed the economic security um, for uh, women and their families uh, legislation, and we lowered taxes for middle class Minnesotans. And I see my time is up, so thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Richard Lieberman. <clears throat> my my uh, campaign manager called me today and he said, Richard, you have a debate tonight. I said, oh, does this mean that I don't have to go out and knock on doors tonight and put out yard signs tonight? And he goes, yep, you got the night off. I went, woo -hoo. So here I am. Um, I was uh, I was listening to uh, the debate uh, that was in 44. That's our neighbor uh, uh, in Plymouth, the A and B side. And when I listened to the debate, there were uh, two of the not incumbents, but the people running were talking about that they are going to. Uh, they love their district. They care passionately about their district. They're going to work so hard for their district and they're gonna make Minnesota the best state that it can be. And what I thought was really odd was, neither one of them said, yeah, but what about right now? Because right now we have some really serious problems. A lot of things are going really, really wrong, and they're very worrisome, and we need to deal with them, and we need to deal with them literally today. We are the seventh highest taxed state in the United States, and that was, uh, that was figured on 2011. And that, then uh, the legislature passed a $2.5 billion tax increase because they overspent themselves by $1 billion, decided to tax us an extra $1.3 billion. So we had a $2.5 billion tax increase. So I don't even know what level uh, we are right now. Um, <clears throat> I am the person that's gonna do the emailing um, I think everybody's pretty much familiar with that, and then I'm going to be uh, sending out the email, and I will send out a link. I will know how people feel, because I think the people in our district have an awful lot of common sense, and I think they can tell me, and they can, they can handle their own affairs, their own lives, and they can tell me exactly uh, how they feel. And by the way, if uh, you don't know that I'm the one that's doing the emailing, just send me your, uh, your address. I'll make sure you get a yard sign, too. Um, Lately, they've been talking about the middle class, and they've been saying how much work the legislature is doing for the middle class. And I just want to share with you that about five years ago, my wife and I used to think that we were middle class. We considered ourselves middle class. We no longer consider ourselves middle class anymore. I would say we're struggling. Our taxes went up. And last year, our health care went up. $2,200, mine and Bonnie's who's sitting out there. We have to pay an additional $2,200 for our health care. And I'm gonna tell you what we call that at home. We call that a budget buster because it busted our budget. So we have some serious problems. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to the questions from the audience. You may continue to write and raise your hand if for, a league, for a league member to come and collect your question during the forum. Questions may be directed to the individual again or both candidates. Each candidate has the opportunity to, to respond to any question. It is our intention to select questions that represent the interests expressed by the members of our audience and those who submitted questions online. We do reserve the right to consolidate questions if there are several on one issue so that they may be covered throughout the period. Uh, the questions are, are in a rotating order. So. My first responder will be Mr. Lieberman. The question is, funding for road and bridge maintenance and construction is always an issue. Would you say it is adequate or not? If it is not adequate, where would more funds come from? Oh, I, I would say probably from not building a bullet train from here to Rochester and save ourselves the billion dollars that they're talking about. 
I would say that we could we could get the money from a lot of places. Mindau was supposed to save us 15% and they were supposed to show the legislature where the 15% was to come from and they never did that. Um, they built it, they're in the process of building a Senate office building, <clears throat> 90 million, the true cost is $76 million for that office building. Uh, by the way, it's $1.3 million for each, uh, each suite that has a window for a part-time worker. Take the $76 million, divide it between each one of the districts, there's 67 districts, and that comes to about $1.1 million. And I'll tell you what, we could fix a lot of roads uh, in this district, especially the roads that are crumbling uh, between 36th Avenue and Northway Parkway with a million dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carlson? Yeah, I, uh, first of all, I think people need to know what uh, happened relative to transportation uh, last session. Uh, we provided in the capital investment bill uh, 33 million for local bridges. We provided 54 million for local road improvements. Uh, 31.5 million for quarters of commerce, which I happen to have been the chief author of that bill. It was in the uh, supplemental appropriations bill. A million for safe routes to schools. Uh, just to mention a uh, few of the uh, issues, uh, railroad uh, upgrades, 2 million, and uh, 10 million for potholes that were uh, just uh, referenced. Uh, that also was in the uh, supplemental appropriations bill that I was the author of. However, transportation is going to be the big issue uh, next legislative session. And uh, various groups are looking at ways in which we're going to, uh, to meet the uh, demand for uh, transportation. Uh, I suspect there's going to be two or three different plans that will uh, come forward. We do have a huge multi-billion dollar shortfall if you project it out about 20 years. So Thank we you. need to uh, fund it. Thank you. Our next question. Do you support the Robbinsdale Area Schools referendums? Yes or no, and why? First responder is Mr. Carlson. Uh, yes, there's two questions on the ballot, and uh, I support uh, the passage of uh, both of those questions. Uh, one uh, doesn't provide for a uh, tax increase. It's a uh, continuing uh, levy. Uh, the other is for technology, and uh, a lot of the uh, school districts in our area have passed levies for uh, technology purposes. And I think we want to make sure that the uh, students in the Robbinsdale School District have uh, the best available equipment so that when they graduate from high school, they'll be able to compete in, their, in our colleges and universities and in the job market. Thank you. Mr. Lieberman? Um, right now, District 281 is in uh, dire need of a lot of help. There needs to be a lot of improvement because if there's a lot of improvement, uh, it's going to keep the students in the schools, not outside of the schools. And ironically, that's going to improve the, or it's going to drop the crime rate. When, when uh, children and kids and uh, students are in schools, good things happen. And I, per, and I specifically asked the superintendent of District 281 this question. Will that money be controlled or manipulated by the legislature or by Common Core? or will you be able to do what you want with that money? He said, we can do what we want with that money. It's not going to be controlled uh, by uh, uh, bureaucrats. And based on that, I would support it. Thank you. Our next question, what areas of education policy would you like to see changed or reformed, if any? First responder is, again, Mr. Carlson. Um. Education policy is something that's uh, near and uh, dear to me, but uh, one of the things I think we have to uh, make sure we do on the uh, policy side is make sure that our students are uh, better prepared to attend a college or university or go into the job market. And uh, one of the things that I would like to see uh, made uh, available for the students would be uh, more uh, opportunities in the area of technical education, hands-on learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I chaired the education uh, many years ago, that was a major initiative that, uh, that I worked on. Uh, I think that would help us retain a lot of students in school, and you're hearing from a former social studies teacher when I say that. Um, but there are many other things, and it's difficult. It's kind of like I was asked at one of these forums, uh, uh, how would you balance the state budget in one minute? 
when you chair ways and means that's kind of hard so one minute to tell all the reforms that you'd like to see in education um, it's a little bit uh, difficult but I would have one comment and I think we have a great school system here in Robbinsdale and we've Thank got you. a tremendous school system across the state of Minnesota so I think what I'm talking about is more fine-tuning thank you mr. Lieberman get rid of Common Core I would author legislation to defeat it or to remove it as quickly as I possibly can when I was knocking on doors 14 different women uh, they were all women uh, uh, told me that they were school teachers and I said what do you think of Common Core they said we hate it we can't stand it we got to get rid of it because we teach to the test and the legislature just recently spent a lot of money to add more testing the ACT test which I just find is, is ludicrous um, how, how there's only there's only two people that really are close to the student those two people are the teacher and the parents they know the student the best they can work with the student the best they know what's best for that student and they can work on a one-to-one -one, go to the superintendent go to the school board and say here's where we need to go here's what we need to do so the first thing I would do is get rid of Common Core and I do agree with Lyndon Carlson about the uh, secondary schools and about the uh, uh, trade schools I think that's huge thank you our next question after a very high profile death of a Minnesota child after multiple reports of abuse there are accusations that the child protection does not follow up consistently and that reporting guidelines have not provided some children with adequate protection what should be done about this and is funding adequate in the system in one minute mr. Lieberman uh, I don't I don't know what funding is in the system I'm not privy to that I've never been in the legislature but I can sure tell you one thing uh, I have five children and my wife and I care dearly about those children and we have seen cases of abuse we've seen where um, things have gone wrong and if there could be laws passed and I don't know what those laws are right now I would absolutely positively support that because we need to have no violence and we need to take care of our children so yes I absolutely support whatever would be brought forth thank you mr. Carlson well first of all uh, I think uh, there probably needs to be an increase in funding so that the uh, counties can do a, a better job uh, following up on uh, reports of uh, abuse and child endangerment uh, secondly uh, it's important to note that the uh, governor in effect was just announced the other day who the members will be has appointed a uh, task force that will be uh, making recommendations to the legislature uh, when we convene in uh, January and uh, he's appointed a number of uh, professionals to um, participate in that uh, process thank you our next question would you support allowing a convicted felon who has been released from prison and on probation to be permitted to vote why or why not and the first responder is mr. Carlson um, if someone has paid their uh, debt to society um, they should be given the right uh, to vote one of the uh, shortcomings um, has been uh, in recent years uh, that uh, the Department of Corrections really hasn't informed people who are being released from prison as to uh, what their rights are and what the process is to get their uh, civil rights uh, reinstated so that uh, that is a first step but uh, if they've paid their debt to society uh, I obviously would support their right to vote thank you mr. Lieberman yes short and sweet like it next question um, it is directed to mr. Lieberman but I again will give you uh, a chance to respond my question has to do with your familiarity on the legislative process your signs state that you will email people before you vote my question is what is your plan for doing this as I'm concerned that it is slightly misleading there were 460 floor votes in the 2014 session that's a lot of emails so your question their question is how are you going to manage all of that for communication to your constituents um. Yeah, I've had a few questions about it, and they have come from the other party. The people, when I knock on their doors and tell them what I'm going to do, they're really quite excited. Evidently, whoever sent that question in, I haven't knocked on their door yet. I am going to email people. 
on major votes or on, a, on major opinionated votes. I've told everybody the same thing. So for those of you in this room, I've already been to your door, I've already collected your email, you know exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna send out just the right amount of emails, that sweet spot. I want it to be so important that, wow, there's something really going on at the Capitol. And I, I voted for Lieberman, I voted him in, he's, he's our representative, where's the email? Then the email comes in and they'll go, it's about time. And then they can tell me exactly how they want me to vote. Um, it's gonna be just the right amount. And it's never been done before, ever, that I've heard of. Thank you. Mr. Carlson? Yeah, I, I think I would respond, uh, you know, uh, by saying uh, I've always been a strong believer in communication with uh, my constituents. And some of the things that I have done is the way I would address uh, this question. I've co-sponsored town hall meetings with the other area legislators, and I've done that uh, for my entire time in the legislature, provided issue uh, questionnaires, end of the session reports, communicated by mail, phone, email, and in person with uh, constituents uh, in a variety of forums and, and various uh, meetings. Um, I would like to point out that, uh, yeah, the 2013 uh, session, if you were emailing everybody, uh, just roll calls on the House floor. This doesn't count committees or anything like that. 560 roll call votes. It doesn't count uh, voice votes, which are very major at times. Uh, floor votes in the uh, 2014 session were 460. It was a shorter session. So there were over 1,000 roll call votes, and I would define those uh, as major. So uh, if you're going to email people uh, with um, uh, that number of votes, uh, people Thank are going to be getting a lot of emails. Thank you. Your time has expired. Next question. The Minnesota Constitution calls for election of judges, but new proposals brought to the legislature call for changing the present method to a merit selection with retention elections. What is your position on this? Do you support party designation for judges? Our first responder is Mr. Carlson. Well, I'll take the uh, second uh, part first. Uh, I think the judges should be uh, nonpartisan, so I do not support uh, party designation uh, for the election of judges. That's been the long history, basically, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, on the uh, other question, I have uh, supported the uh, reforms that uh, uh, Governor Cui and others have uh, advocated for in terms of the uh, judicial uh, selection uh, process. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Lieberman? Um, I haven't given that question a lot of thought. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Our next question. What is your position on parenting individuals with, do with domestic violence convictions from owning guns? I'm sorry, preventing that legibility. <laughs> preventing individuals with domestic violence convictions from owning guns. What is your posi position on this, Mr. Lieberman? Um, I think that people should have the right to bear arms. It is in the Second Amendment, and I do very much support that. Um, I also believe that uh, there should be uh, accountability, and we've seen some very sick people do some horrendous things uh, out in Denver and in some other cities, and those people we want to keep from having guns. Those are the kind of people that absolutely should not have guns. So um, there's, a, there's a differentiation there. We won't take the rights away from people to bear arms. It's given to us in the Constitution, but we also have to be careful on who gets those guns. Uh, and just if I have 10 seconds left, I did say that I was gonna send out the right amount of emails and I heard, uh, I heard my opponents say that four or 500 emails was a lot of emails and I don't remember hearing myself say that, but I can tell you one thing, it's going to happen, and people's voices will be heard. Thank you. Your time has expired. Uh, Mr. Carlson. Uh, I think people that have been convicted of uh, domestic violence uh, should not uh, have um, weapons. Um, it seems like almost daily or at least weekly you can pick up the uh, newspaper and you can see where uh, uh, there's been a situation involving domestic violence and a weapon has been used. Uh, so I think we uh, have to look uh, at uh, what we can do to make sure that they don't have access to uh, weapons. Um, we did um, beef up the funding for uh, mental health initiatives uh, dealing with uh, crimes as a result of using weapons and so on during this last legislative session. 
and that was one issue that there was consensus when you're dealing with mental health and very often domestic violence has a mental health component and uh, both uh, proponents and opponents of um, gun safety or gun control uh, supported the mental health provisions. Thank you. Next question, how effective do you, each of you think the welfare to work and job training programs these last two years have been? Uh, first responder is Mr. Carlson. Um, could you repeat that question? Mm -hmm. Did you say the welfare to work or? We'll give both of them the chance. So I'm trying to do it equally. So um, if you could repeat the question, how effective do you think each of the or do each of you think that the welfare to work and job training programs have been the last two years? Um, well, when I, I mentioned uh, earlier uh, the area of uh, technical vocational education, there's a huge uh, need there. Uh, one of the problems that uh, we've encountered that will be uh, worked on during the next legislative session is uh, doing a better job of aligning the uh, needs of uh, businesses with um, the jobs that are available. Uh, we uh, have a disconnect, if you will. Uh, there are a lot of jobs, if you pick up in the, the newspaper, that go wanting because we don't have enough trained people. And uh, Minsku, the uh, largest provider of uh, the workforce in the state of Minnesota, is uh, working on that very issue. The chancellor has had um, hearings around the state, has had input from the business community, and uh, the plan is to be responsive to that uh, during the next legislative session. Thank you. Mr. Lieberman? I think our welfare system is broken, plain blank, and I think we're all pretty much aware of that. Uh, we have, I, I remember reading in the paper, and it was uh, on a cold January winter day, that there was a couple that was on the Caribbean in a houseboat, and they received $186,000 of Minnesota welfare money. I mean, it's not bad enough that they received that money sitting on a houseboat, but I had to read about it in January when it was 20 below out. I mean, seriously. I think what we really need to do is, uh, like Mr. Carlson said, we need to match up, we need to train people, we need to give people opportunities. So if you have a welfare system and somebody's just collecting money and feels like they're never gonna get a job and they don't work and they can't participate, and they're not very happy with life because they can't, I think if, if we can provide them opportunity and say, look, instead of taking that welfare money and giving it to you, we will teach you um, a trade, we will help you go to a technical college and you can get a job. Thank you. Our next question. There are recent newspaper reports of the, that the number of deaths from heroin overdose exceed the number of traffic deaths. What measures, like new laws or regulations, can be taken to reduce the use and or deaths from heroin? Our first responder is Mr. Carlson. Well, I think uh, one of the chief uh, components of anything that can be done uh, is um, education to make sure people understand the risks when you uh, get involved with uh, drugs, whatever the drug happens to be, and heroin is one of the fastest growing in the state of Minnesota. Um, the other thing is uh, the role of law enforcement, and if anybody watched the news tonight, there was a major uh, drug bust uh, of a heroin uh, network uh, where they were uh, arrested and will be prosecuted. That was one of the largest uh, in the state and probably one of the largest in the history of the state that uh, we had the uh, attorneys, uh, the uh, U.S. attorney on TV uh, telling about that drug bust today. So it's education and, and law enforcement. Thank you. Mr. Lieberman? As much as I want to cut taxes and be fiscally conservative, I do have a little bit of experience. I do go to a certain club once a week, and I've been going there for many, many decades, and I sponsor people, and, and I owe my life to it. I can tell you from experience that if you fund and help certain organizations right here in this town, they will help those individuals. You can pass laws. You can say, if you do that, I'll send you to prison. They'll do it. They'll go to prison. It just doesn't work that way. It won't succeed. But if you reach out to organizations, and they're all over, Minnesota is the uh, treatment model for the United States and the world. And it all started at Hazelden and it started at St. Mary's back in 1976. And if you help fund those organizations and support those organizations, they know how best to work with people on a one-to-one. -one, and you'd be amazed at the 
uh, at the wonderful uh, results that will happen. Thank you. Our final audience question. Homelessness is a problem in Minnesota, even in our own community. What can the legislature do to alleviate the, pl the, the plight of these homeless? Uh, the first responder is Mr. Lieberman. <clears throat> I spend a tremendous amount of my time down at the homeless shelter, Harbor Light. It's downtown Minneapolis at the old Dayton's Warehouse building. As a matter of fact, if you look at my Facebook, uh, you'll see uh, I sometimes put the blue barrel out for towels and for socks for that organization. And actually, last week, I brought down so many towels and socks and pants. If you were some of the people that, and there was, there was cases of soap in that barrel. I actually put my back out when I was uh, trying to bring it all into the Harbor Light Shelter. Um, there are organizations, Salvation Army is, is an incredible organization. They, they really do the most good. If we want to help the homeless people, let's go to the people that are the experts, the people that do it every single day of their lives, that have committed to it, and let's give them even more support because they will work with the homeless and then they move them to the next level and then to another level and then they finally find them uh, homes to live in. Thank you. And Mr. Carlson. Yes, that, uh, a couple of points that I'd like to make. Uh, one is uh, volunteerism is vitally important uh, in a variety of ways, but uh, being that we're talking about the uh, homeless, uh, I do know for a fact that uh, many of those shelters and so on are in dire need of volunteers, so I would suggest anybody in the audience that's interested, they do that. Uh, the Minnesota legislature, uh, because it's located in St. Paul, uh, we volunteer uh, as a legislative body, bipartisanly, um, to uh, go down to the uh, Dorothy Day Center in downtown St. Paul, which is a center for the homeless. Um, so many of us uh, participate at that uh, level. We also, in the uh, capital investment bill, uh, provided um, major uh, appropriations, tens of millions of dollars for um, facilities for the, uh, for the homeless. Thank you. We're now going to move on to our final statements, in which you have one minute to give your final thoughts for the evening. We're going in reverse order, if I can remember which one of you started first, which was you. I went first. Good. So now we're going with Mr. Richard Lieberman. I thought we were going to do it the other way. You boys. All right. Okay. Whatever. I, 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 I can go I, either I, way. I, I, one minute. I, I, I don't care. All right. Let's just, uh, please start the clock back. with are doing the football yes, game. Yes, please. Um, I no I've knocked on a lot of doors. When I knock on those doors, um, I say that I'm going to email you with a link, and, they're, and you're going to be able to know what's going on, and you're going to be able to respond. You're going to be able to tell me with a couple of clicks how you want me to vote, your comments. And when I tell people that, sometimes I can't even finish tell it, talking, and they give me their email address. People do want to be heard. It is going to be done. And if it isn't done, if I'm not elected this time, it's going to be done by the next person because people really want to be heard. They want their voice to count. And people are very, very smart. They do know what's best for them, and they have common sense, and they don't like the way the state is going with its taxes, with Common Core, and with many other things. They would have voted no on that football stadium. Believe me, I knocked on enough doors. They said, how come uh, there was a, uh, supposed to be a vote on a $10 million referendum on that football stadium, but there wasn't? People's voices want to be heard, and they're going to be heard. And I'm going to hear them, Thank and you. I'm bringing them to St. Paul. Thank you. And Mr. Lyndon Carlson. Yeah, just a, a, being that we're talking about communication, uh, just a quick comment. When I listed the votes that were uh, roll call in the last legislative session, I was just giving that as an example of the number of votes. I have no idea how many emails Mr. Lieberman may or may not uh, send out. Um, my ending statement uh, would uh, be to focus on a couple of things. One is that um, I'm just completing my 21st term. And I have 100% attendance in uh, 42 years in the legislature, so I've never missed a legislative day. So I'm on the job, I'm casting the votes. As I said earlier, communication is important. And uh, I've uh, co-sponsored town hall meetings. If I'm fortunate enough to be reelected, I plan on doing that again. Uh, I will again provide uh, issue questionnaires, end of session reports. Uh, I will be communicating by mail, phone, and email with the uh, people in the district as I always have done. I would appreciate your support on uh, November the 4th. Thank you. 
Thank you. You've now heard from both of your candidates for the House of Representatives for District 45A. If your question was not asked this evening, we invite you to contact the candidates directly with your concerns. We will now take a short five-minute break and set up for 45B. Thank you.
Our opening statements will begin for District 45B, House of Representatives. The candidates from District 45B are, I'm going to get this non-Spanish brain of mine going, Alma <laughs> Wetzger, a member of the Independent Republican Party, and Mike Freiberg, a member of the DFL Party. District 45B encompasses Robbinsdale, Southern Crystal, Precinct 1 in New Hope, and the northern half of Golden Valley. My timekeeper is up in the front there, and he will assist you by indicating how much time remains and when to stop. He's got the nice red card there for you. Please begin with your opening statements, in which you have three minutes. We did the flip coin, and Mr. Freiberg won the first responding position. Mike Freiberg, please introduce yourself to your audience. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Mike Freiberg, and I'm running for re-election to the Minnesota House of Representatives for District 45B, which includes all or parts of Crystal, Golden Valley, New Hope, and Robbinsdale. Um, it's been a privilege to serve you these past two years, and Minnesota has made so much progress. With my support, we were able to balance the state budget without gimmicks, guarantee all-day kindergarten, pay back our schools, freeze tuition at Minnesota's public colleges and universities, invest in early childhood education, adopt the Women's Economic Security Act, enact marriage equality, and raise the minimum wage. I've been a strong advocate for our communities here in the Northwest suburbs. When the legislature decided to exempt local governments from paying sales tax, for example, it didn't exempt local governments operating efficiently through joint powers organizations. Now, an example of a joint powers organization is the West Metro Fire Rescue District, which serves Crystal and New Hope. I listened to the cities in our district and successfully fought to exempt joint powers organizations like West Metro from sales tax. This will help keep our property taxes down. And because of work like this, the League of Minnesota Cities twice named me a legislator of distinction. I look forward to discussing the issues facing the district in the upcoming debate. I hope that when we're done, you'll support me on November 4th. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of Crystal, New Hope, and East Plymouth for sponsoring this debate. And I'd like to thank my opponent, Mr. Wetzger, for running a positive and issues-based campaign. Thank you. And our next speaker is Mr. Alma Wetzger. Hi, I'm Alma Wetzger. I'm running for District 45B. My wife and I and our family moved up here almost 20 years ago, actually just about 19 years ago. And we were so blessed to be in a magnificent community. We've had a pumpkin festival going on for the past 17 years, and it's been an, just an amazing group. I have been involved in the Cub Scout organization. I've been involved in the Boy Scouts. We raised our seven children here. And it, it's just been an amazing environment. I've been involved in the political process, but it's my turn to get more involved. I'm a business owner, and I know from experience that what's been happening at the state level is impacting not just my family, but the bottom line for the, my business. We've got to get Minnesota back on track, and we can do it. We've been there, both in education, in business taxes. You know, I'm not about cutting taxes to the bone. The weather in this state alone justifies higher taxes because we have to resurface the streets, because we scrape them off a lot. So I'm about being reasonable. I'm an engineer. I solve problems. And if you look at my literature, I'm running as a hardcore moderate. I don't care where the good solution comes from. I don't. I don't care about a partisan side. I want to get Minnesota to be a better state for a business environment instead of 47th or 48th out of 50. I want to get our school system back engaged to be the top of the nation again, like the one like it was when I was in school. Our teachers are the best. We can do it. We just have to give them a little bit more control. And you'll hear me talk all about one size fits all, doesn't fit anybody, whether it's Common Core or anything imposed from the top, it doesn't work. We need to have you as voters empowered to make decisions at your level and have those decisions that need to be made at a higher level done at the lowest level of government possible so that you know your legislature and you know who to call to make a difference. We deserve 
that kind of government where we can make those choices that affect us and call Mike, who's been responsive all along. I really appreciate Mike and the positive campaign he's been running, but there are options. There needs to be an option, and I'm hoping to provide that for liberty and opportunity. Thank you. We're now going to move on to the audience questions. Again, you may continue to write and raise your hand for a league member to collect your question and bring them up to um, my assistants up here. The questions may be directed to an individual or to both candidates, and we will give both candidates a chance to respond to any question. It is our intention, again, to select the questions that represent the interests expressed by the community and of our audience of who submitted the questions online. We reserve the right, again, to consolidate questions if they have the same topic. Make sure that we can read them. So our first question is, to stick with the education topic, do you support the Robbinsdale Area Schools referendums? And our first responder will again be Mr. Freiberg. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I support both questions, uh, renewing the existing operating levy and the technology question that's on there. I have two little kids, uh, Rose and Joseph. They are four years old and one year old, almost five and two. Um, they, we live in the Robbinsdale School District and care deeply what happens to it. Rose will be going to kindergarten next year. Um, we know how important technology is for our children to be competitive in the marketplace today. Um, so I, I'm a strong supporter. I would encourage everybody out there uh, who lives in the Robbinsdale District to support, to support both questions as well. Thank you. Mr. Wetzger. Personally, I will probably be voting for both of those measures. One of them is a continuation of existing tax measures. Now is not the time to subtract that money from the district operating funds. It's just not. On the technology issue, that's like all of our neighboring districts are jumping off a cliff, so we need to jump off a cliff too. I'm a little bit fuzzy on that kind of logic, but that is the way the game is played right now, and it's not a large levy. My concern there is the amount of trained facilitators in the schools that can actually teach technology. We're going from one to two. If you're familiar with the setup at all, there just aren't enough trained facilitators, whether it's teaching staff or whatever, to get the technology used in the students' hands. And I'm concerned a little bit about how that's structured, but I'm voting for them. Thank you. Please share your views on early childhood family education and what the legislature could or should do about it. Uh, the first responder will be Mr. Wetzger. Somebody wants to get me in trouble. I'm not sure exactly where the government's interest in this comes from. This is something that communities, parts of communities, need to address within their subcultures. We have different immigrant communities that have different standards and different values. Those issues are best addressed through those community outreach services and those smaller groups. Coming down from the state to impose a particular standard robs people of the ability to make choices and raise their families the way they want. I would prefer a more community-based approach rather than a state-based approach. Okay. And Mr. Freiberg? Uh, I'm a strong believer in early childhood education. I mentioned I have uh, little kids, and they go to daycare right here in New Hope. Um, and just seeing, you know, we'll call them teachers there, even though it's daycare and they have lesson plans for them, but seeing just how much my kids benefit from it, um, it's something I think that should be available for everybody if that's what they choose to do with their kids. Uh, we made a good start in it. It, during the last legislative session, um, investing in early childhood scholarships, um, and I think we should go further. Um, I, you know, we we created all-day kindergarten um, for the first time last year. I think that was a huge step. I was a strong supporter of that. I was thrilled that we were able to do that. I was thrilled we were able to begin making some improvements in the area of early childhood. But I think we should expand it so that more people can take advantage of it. Thank you. Our next question. Would you support an addition to the gas tax to fund our transportation roads and bridges? First responder is Mr. Wetzker. I would prefer a reallocation of our gas tax away from things like 
white rail or the Botano line at this point. We're getting bus service cut in the 20 years that I've lived in our area because of lack of ridership. And now we're putting a very expensive light rail funded by our gas tax that's supposed to go to roads in a corridor with not a lot of ridership. There's an allocation problem. I like light rail. I've been to cities where they've had population density to support it. It's not that I'm categorically against it, but we can't even operate it at a break near or break even point, let alone invest in it. That's just a bad idea. We need to reinvest those gas tax monies better. Thank you. Mr. Freiberg? Um, I would be open to that. I guess I'd like to see exactly what sort of proposals before us. Um, I do think transportation is going to be one of the key, is going to be the key issue during the next session. Um, there's a group called Move Minnesota that started advocating for a comprehensive transportation plan for Minnesota, and that's certainly something I support. I think the gas tax itself is somewhat outdated. Um, people's driving habits are changing. They're driving less. Um, cars are more fuel efficient so the gas tax doesn't buy what it used to. Um, so there, I know there are proposals out there to change it to being taxed at the wholesale level. I think that's something that we should look at. Um, and, uh, you know, generally at the legislature, the way it tends to work is um, if you, you can talk about a, a gas tax increase and the metro, the rural members generally support that, um, you know, certainly at least in one of the parties they do anyway, and a metro area for things like, ma and a metro area sales tax for things like mass transit, and I strongly support the Botano corridor. Thank you. How do you propose to encourage job growth in the private sector? First responder is Mr. Freiberg. Sure. Um, we did invest a great deal in uh, in jobs uh, during the last session. We passed uh, large jobs bills both in 2013 and again in 2014 once we learned that we had a surplus. Um, you know, one of one of the things we can do to, to improve the job situation is pass a bonding bill, and we did that during the last session. Um, those create a large number of jobs for people in various in various trades and, and benefit as well. Um, another thing we did during the past session um, we repealed the business to business taxes, which um, became part of the, the budget solution at the end of 2013. I was glad that those didn't stay there. And I think property taxes are a piece of the puzzle, too. I think if we um, can keep those low as we have, uh, that will improve the jobs climate in the private sector. Thank you. Mr. Wetzger? Government doesn't create jobs. Small businesses create jobs. Big businesses are trying to cut job, cut costs, which means jobs. We need to enable, get out of the way of small business growth. I graduated fairly recently with my electrical engineering degree from the University of Minnesota. Several of my college classmates, instead of staying in Minnesota, where Minnesota can reap the benefits of having a good research university, left the state to start a small startup company that employs five to seven people for three or four or five years and gives them great executive and management and training in further job growth. We need to keep those people here where they can add to our talent pool. Thank you. Will you support and promote the labeling of GMOs on foods. Please explain your answer. Mr. Freiberg. Uh, I guess I'm open to it. I'd like to have a little more information on that. I haven't made a total, uh, I haven't completely decided it's something I've been hearing a lot about. Um, in my uh, non-legislative capacity, I work in the public health field, um, and I feel, generally speaking, it's uh, important for consumers to know, you know, what what's in the food that they're eating. Um, and so I think there's certainly some merit to the argument. You know, I'd want to make sure it's done in a way that doesn't lead to information overload. Um, so if, you know, it, it's something a lot of people want to know, I guess, is, is sort of the sense I have. And so it's something I'm open to. Mr. Wetzger? I approach this as a scientist. I can't tell the difference between 
a molecule from a GMO plant and a molecule from a normally genetically engineered plant that we've done through hybridization and cross-fertilization. It, it looks like same, same to me. I'd love to see some real studies, peer-reviewed studies, about what the difference is to see if there is one. In the meantime, we've got organic certifications. If you want a real organic certifi certification, go for the state of California, which is uniform across the states and is the highest standard available. If you want pure organic, because organic to this chemical guy means it has carbon in it, like most life. So go with the California standard, and we've got something that addresses that today. Let's get a scientific study out there and find out what the real difference is. Thank you. The Minnesota Constitution calls for election of judges, but new proposals brought to the legislature call for changing the present method to merit selection with the retention elections. What is your position, and do you support party designation for judges? Mr. Wetzger, you're our first responder. I moved up here from Missouri. The panel you're talking about is sometimes called the Missouri system. And in practice, it usually entrenches a single, a single political party in the judgeships. And in practice, it reinforces a good old boy network. I don't necessarily like that. I like the open selection, uh, the election of judges, point blank in Minnesota. I think it's a good idea, and that's what the Constitution calls for, for goodness sakes. Let's just do that. We need to have a choice. It would be nice if there were an easier way to find out where a judge was coming from with partisan designation, but I'm not quite sure that's the right way to do it because it is a nonpartisan situation. So I don't have a perfect answer for that, but I don't want to go to a panel. No, I've seen it. Mr. Freiberg? Uh, I am troubled by the increasing politicization of uh, judges, you know, around the country. I mean, you hear about other states where there's a large amount of money spent to influence judicial elections. Um, so this, you know, I know the League of Women Voters uh, supports this proposal. I know there's bipartisan support, both from former Governor Cui, um, as well as from the DFL party. Um, so it is something I'm inclined to support, um, and uh, I have concerns with partisan designation of judges also. I don't, um, you know, how you rule on the law shouldn't be influenced by what your political party is. Would you support allowing a convicted felon who has been released from prison and probation to be permitted to vote? Why or why not? Who's up? Let's see. Wetzger. <laughs> On probation, no. Completed probation, yes. When they've completed probation, they've fulfilled their obligation to society, and they should have those rights restored. Until they've completed that sentence, no. Mr. Freiburn? Uh, yes, I would say. I mean, I do. I feel like if they have been incarcerated and served their time in prison, uh, then they should be, you know, they're out, they're back in the community. Hopefully they're working and paying taxes. I think they should be able to vote at that point. Um, you know, when we had the debate about the voter ID amendment, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion about voter fraud, and it turns out the main time voter fraud happens is because felons released from prison who haven't finished their parole didn't really know what they were supposed to be doing. So, you know, if they're in the, if they're out, if we trust them to be out in the community, which I think we do, if they're released from prison, I think we should uh, entrust them to make decisions about who governs them and makes decisions about the taxes that they pay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. After the very high profile death of a Minnesota child, after multiple reports of abuse, there were the accusations that child protection does not follow up consistently and that reporting guidelines have not protected some children. What should be done about this? Is funding adequate in the system? First responder is Mr. Freiberg. Yeah, I was, I mean, as a parent, you know, as a parent, you don't have to be a parent to just be heartbroken by reading the story about Eric Dean and what happened and how the system failed him. It was, it was just a true tragedy. Um, you know, the, in response to that, the governor issued several executive, made several executive actions. 
Um, he announced that there would be random inspections. Uh, he, he announced uh, the creation of a task force that would make recommendations to the legislature. And uh, I certainly support those actions. And I expect that when the legislature reconvenes, uh, those recommendations will be one of the first things we'll act on to prevent things like this from happening in the future. Thank you. Mr. Wetzger? I've seen the results of that personally, and it breaks my heart. I worked as a paramedic for a while. As a parent, you don't need to imagine how heartbreaking that is. And the system did fail. We had a system in place, and it didn't work. That needs to be addressed. I'm not sure that there's necessarily a change in funding. I'm not sure that you could solve all those problems. If we're going to be a free society, I'm not sure you can stop a determined attacker from attacking. But it is heartbreaking. Yeah. Thank you. The recent newspaper reports that the number of deaths of heroin overdose exceed the, that of uh, traffic accidents and deaths. What measures can be, uh, like new laws or regulations, can be taken to reduce the deaths of heroin use and overdose? Mr. Mr. Freiberg. Uh, one thing that we did during the past session uh, was authorize police to carry the antidote for heroin overdoses, and that's certainly something I support. Um, I, I think it was overdue. I think uh, heroin, it's, it's amazing to me just the stories you hear about heroin now. It seems like something that couldn't happen in our community, uh, but it is, and it's really troubling. So, you know, that's one way I think we can address the specific issue of overdoses, and I supported that. Um, I also think we, uh, we need education, you know, we need education about the problem, we need to fund the Department of Corrections to address the issue. Um, so uh, it's a serious problem. Um, we're beginning to make steps, and there's certainly more to do. Mr. Wetzger? I also support the police carrying methadone. That's a really good step. It should be available to most first responders. I guess my flip answer was, is we could make it illegal. But, you know, <laughs> drugs, abortion, guns, you know, we can make lots of things illegal, but it's not going to solve the problem. And it is a problem. These, heroin especially is one of those drugs that can just take away your free will and enslave you. I think, personally, my biggest antidote would be hope. If we didn't have a moribund economy, with no jobs, and it's very difficult to get engaged and even have what your parents had, you're going to run into more and more of these problems. I think giving people hope and a chance to be better, reigniting the American dream, is probably going to be long-term our best solution. Thank you. What is your position on preventing individuals with domestic violence convictions from owning guns? First responder is Mr. Wetzger. Well, I already alluded to how hard it's going to be to get. The Bill of Rights is nine amendments explicitly stating rights in the U.S. Constitution. And the Minnesota Constitution supports that. It's not a buffet where you go and get a double helping of free speech without responsibility, but you're going to say no to the gun rights. We get all of it. All of those rights together hang together, and it's what the framers of our Constitution thought needed to be in place for a free and just society. We can't just pick and choose. I would be very reluctant to take away rights. If somebody wants a gun, they'll get a gun, and it's not the gun, it's not the weapon, it's the person that's a problem. Mr. Freiberg? I supported the bill uh, to prevent people who are convicted of domestic violence from owning a gun. I think um, after, you know, some of the tragic events we've seen, whether it's in Connecticut or Colorado, um, that's certainly the, 
the bare minimum, I think, of, of what we could do. Thank you. Are you willing to do to decide the polymet mining issue if the environment uh, was damaged for centuries to come just to create jobs for 30 years? It's a big wager. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, I had to read that correctly. So are you willing to decide on the polymet mining issue if the environment is damaged for centuries to become just to create jobs for 30 years? First responder is Mr. Wetzger. Oh, lovely. <laughs> There are a couple assumptions there that I'm not sure I agree with. Minnesota's been mining for a long time. We know how to do it right, and we know a little bit about how to do it wrong. There's good technology there. We can do it without permanent damage to the environment. The Earth's a living system. It renews itself. We know how to take care of our environment. We've done it. We're good stewards in Minnesota. I, I don't think that that's a valid opposition to saying let's open up the uh, the copper range to lots of opportunity have you been through north dakota lately where 14 dollars an hour jobs to sit overnight in the filling station go wanting for lack of people to work them because there's so many jobs we could do that in minnesota mr freiberg I guess I'd agree with Mr. Wesker that that was there were some assumptions in that question. Uh, the way and the way it's worded, certainly my answer would be no. I would not support it if it does that sort of damage. You know, I do think we need to um, wait for the environmental review process to work out uh, to go through the process. I mean, I do have you know, I do have concerns, very serious concerns with the project, though, with the potential for environmental damage. I guess I'd say that I'm not going to commit myself to opposing it categorically at this point, but um, I do have some concerns. And I should mention, too, I serve on the Environment Finance Committee at the House, and we held a hearing on this issue. It was specific to the issue of financial assurance, and there was actually a representative from the Polymet Corporation who spoke at that hearing. and. From in my perspective, he was basically unable to answer basic questions about what would go on there. And you know, as long as that level of information is being provided to us, I will continue to be pretty skeptical about that proposal. Thank you. We're now going to move on to your final one-minute statements, and we're going in the reverse order in which you started. So, Mr. Alma Wetzger. Minnesota is a great community. It's a great state. It's got a lot to recommend. My personal observation is things have kind of gone off the track in the past little bit, at least in my finances, in my situation. There are options. We need to get it back on track. We need to bring Minnesota back up to first place in education. And we can do that. We've got the best teachers. And higher up in the tax friendliness for small businesses. With those things in place, we are positioned very well for a magnificent future, and I want to lead us there. Thank you. And Mr. Mike Freiberg. Uh, first of all, I'd like to once again thank the League of Women Voters of Crystal, New Hope, and East Plymouth for sponsoring this debate, um, as well as my opponent for running a positive campaign. We've made so much progress over the last two years, and I hope you'll give me the chance to continue the work I started. Um, if you look at where we were two years ago, we had a debt that was owed to our schools. We had divisive amendments on the ballot. And I think when you consider that, the record of progress we've made over the last two years is that much clearer. But there's more to be done. Um, and if reelected, I will focus on a comprehensive transportation package that includes mass transit. I'll work to invest further in early childhood education. And I'll work to address the cost of college. So I hope you'll consider supporting me, Mike Freiberg, on November 4th. And thank you all for attending this important debate. Thank you. You have heard from the candidates for House of, State House of Representatives for District 45B. Again, if your question was not, was not addressed this evening or you think of something new inspirational you want to ask them, please contact them directly. They seem like wonderful gentlemen that want to answer your questions. Thank you for participating this evening and for 45A as well. And thank you, audience members, for coming and selecting wonderful questions. Let's have a big hand for our candidates who have done their part tonight. And please don't forget your part, which is to go out and vote on November 4th. Now let's hear from our local president. We would like to thank the candidates and the moderator, Kirsten jo Chomey, for participating in this forum. The election will be held on Tuesday, November 4th, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. If you are not a registered voter, 
you may register at the polls if you have been a resident of the state for at least 20 days before the election, have a valid Minnesota driver's license, learner's permit, or Minnesota identification card, or a receipt of any of these, showing the correct address in the precinct. You may also register accompanied by a registered voter in the precinct, precinct who will take, you, take an oath along with the election judge that you qualify to vote in that precinct. You can vote early by using an absentee ballot instead of voting in person at the polling place on the election day. You can vote absentee by mail, in person, or by having a person you know pick up and deliver your ballot to you. Beginning with the 2014 elections, any voter may vote absentee. Absentee ballots are available 46 days before the election. For additional questions, contact your city clerk. If a member of this audience or a cable TV audience feels an issue has not been adequately addressed, League of Women Voters urges you to contact the candidates directly. Campaign literature provided by the candidates is on a table in the hallway outside this room. The League of Women Voters encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Membership is open to men and women of all ages. For more information about the League of Women Voters, visit www.lwvmn.org and follow the prompts to our local league, the Crystal New Hope East Plymouth League, or contact us by email at lwvenhepmn at gmail.com. We would also encourage you to become a member as we provide service to our community and to join us in nonpartisan study of local, state, and national issues. Please pick up some of the League's information available on the table outside. Um, this week on Wednesday, October 8th, we will be having an informational meeting on the District 281 referendum at the school district office. It starts at 7 o'clock. And on Thursday, October 8th, we will be having a candidates for the candidates for the school board forum also at the Educational Service Center. Um, tonight's forum will be replayed on cable channel 12 on Sunday, October 12th at 1 o'clock p.m. Also, it can be accessed online at 12.tv on the local vote page. Thank you for attending tonight.